Hjärtligt välkomna. Jag heter Fredrik Wetterqvist och är ständig sekreterare i Kungliga Musikaliska Akademin. Akademin fyller som säkert flera av er vet där hemma 250 år i år. Ett musikens år mitt i denna märkliga tid som vi försöker fylla med så mycket klingande och levande musik som möjligt. I samarbete med ett stort antal institutioner, organisationer, konserthus. Kvällens klingande akademi är inget undantag. Och faktiskt en i en lång serie av klingande akademier med just Stockholms konserthus. Vi har ungefär 70 samarbetspartners. Och alla har förstås tänkt sig att kunna arrangera musik för publik i salongen. Vi har varit lyckligt lottade så tillvida att vi har kunnat streama alla våra aktiviteter så här långt. Och det är vi väldigt glada för. Många av er har följt våra arrangemang redan. Vi har hunnit avverka kanske 20-30 stycken så här långt in på året. Och har väldigt många aktiviteter kvar. Närmast 14 maj släpper Erik, Voka Erik Westbergs vokalensemble en helt unik inspelning av Andreas Halléns Missa Solemnis från 1921. Ett hundraårsjubileum. Därefter har vi till exempel Blåsmusikens dag som vi hoppas ska fylla hela Sverige med blåsmusik lördag den 22 maj. Let me say a few words also in English to uh, listeners from abroad. In particular, I know we have guests from the United States and England this evening. Uh, we're delighted uh, to be able to uh, uh, arrange this seminar in English, uh, not only for obvious reasons, our guests, uh, but also to reach out a little bit. Uh, for those of you who would like to uh, join in for another seminar in English, on June 5th we'll arrange something on 18th century music again. It's the Italian composer Utini. Swedish composer Jonsson, French composer Rousseau's uh, music opera play Birger Jarl that we uh, uh, talk about and uh, perform music from uh, in conjunction with the Stockholm Early Music Festival. Saturday, June 5th will be uh, digitally uh, broadcast and in English. Uh, now it's high time for me to hand over the microphone to this evening's moderator, conductor Olof Boman. Thanks. Tack så mycket, Fredrik. Och då får jag också säga välkommen till den här klingande akademin som ska bli ett musikaliskt samtal som vi idag ska ägna den svenska 1700-talskomponisten och musiken Johan Helmich Roman. Vi befinner oss här på konserthuset i Stockholm i Grynevaldsalen. Och här på scenen ska vi de närmsta minuterna umgås med denna Roman och hans värld. Och det ska vi göra bland annat tillsammans med en internationell gäst på besök i Stockholm just nu, Mr. Tom Kuppman. And that's why we from now on will do this in English. Before I introduce you, Mr. Kuppman, I will introduce another guest, Eva Helenius. You are a musicologist mm -hmm. and you have spent a lot of time together with mm -hmm. Roman. And I dare to say that You are the one knowing most about this guy right now. And we're happy to have you here. You uh, soon finish your book about Roman and his mm -hmm. life and his time. We're looking forward to that. And you are also running Klaverens Hus, a unique collection of keyboard instruments from the past. Welcome. Swedish make. Swedish make uh, keyboard because, instruments. Because we have no factories anymore. No, it's true. Oh, so to... Good. Mr. Kuppman, you come from the Netherlands and you have been around as harpsichordist, organist and conductor as long as I know. Uh, already in 1979 you founded Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra and uh, since that you have toured all over the world with the, that group but also as a guest conductor and uh, This, this week you're here in Stockholm to conduct the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Welcome. Thank you. In that program that you will conduct tomorrow with the orchestra, 
here at the concert, the concert hall in Stockholm, you will also play a Sinfonia by Roman. Um, and my name is Olof Boman. I'm a conductor and artistic leader of Confidence and Opera and Music Festival at Ulrik Stahl's Court Theatre here outside Stockholm. And from that festival orchestra, we have a bunch of lovely musicians here on stage. Uh, Peter Spiski, leader, Lina Söderholtz, violin, uh, Martin Lissula, viola, Mime Brinkman, cello, Marcus Molin, harpsichord. Welcome to you all. And we have also Jenny Eriksson Nordin, soprano, who jumped in with short notice today. We're very happy that you're here and will sing for us. Uh, before we let you play uh, a larghetto and two gavotas from uh, Ruman's party music uh, for a party in Stockholm 1728, I also want to introduce Max Låke. He's sitting there behind the cameras and he makes everything work today. I'm here. You're there. That's, that's good for us to know. <laughs> and then, dear audience, of course, we really miss you here in the hall today. But we know that you are there, and I hope that you can feel some of the excitement that we feel here on stage right now. So, let's hear some music by this Johan Helmich Roma.
Eva, who was this guy play, um, composing this lovely music? The man whom we honor today is one of the most important persons in Swedish music history ever. Who was he then? Yeah. <laughs> and what did he do to get, s get such a praising esteem of the posterity? posterity? It's not the easiest thing to do research about this humble and self-denying person who, according to his biographer, Abraham Magnusson Salstedt, Max Verstabilden, could not stand his own praise, nor did he push his way to be famous. Already in the 1760s, Salstedt had difficulties in finding information on Roma. He had Roman's own biographical notes at hand when he wrote his biography, but never gave it back to the Royal Academy of Science from which he borrowed them. The rare split and scattered sources on this personality reveal a multi-gifted and intelligent person. His contemporaries described him as a man who broke the eyes of this science in spite of many difficulties put the court music right with very weak facilities so that he used more pains than necessary and more pains than his colleagues at other European courts needed if had got a sufficient assistance to reform the court music. He was a man of unusual industry and management who as far as possible hide to the lack of good musicians in the Royal Orchestra caused by an insufficient budget which had been established at a time when music was not considered a grace for the court and for the nation. Uh, that was in 1696. Thus a man who spared no efforts and costs to the honor of the court and the nation, now in 30 years has been the, in charge of the court music these statements by the director of the Royal Orchestra, Reinhold von Fashen, gave, gave a good portrait of him in words, portrait of him in words, although there is no sure portrait, a uh, painted portrait of him, he is most probably found among the paintings of musicians around the music-loving Count Adam Hohn in the little uh, music house earlier at its manor, Fogelvi. And Max, can we have portrait can we have? <laughs> like, so this is the only painting of Roman that we yes, have. Yes. Um, are we sure that that is Roman? Ninety-nine percent. Ninety-nine percent. Okay. Yeah, let's, yes, because let's they, go with that. The, yes, um, they are all um, can be all connected to the court. Okay. Here. And he's playing the violin. So he's playing the violin, and I identified him uh, on the dress. Okay. Uh, because in uh, 1945 he was appointed a court intendant and he had a, um, the uh, uh, right along, um, a of, range, of, range uh, yeah. of, of uh, Chamberlain okay. and then also had the right of bearing, uh, having the, the dress. Mm -hmm. So the count himself um, has the uh, Chamberlain uh, feast dress and Roman has the Chamberlain uh, every day. Well, that's what yes. he, he's wearing on that yeah. portrait. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Today we value him as a pioneer and a prominent figure who, in his thinking, was much ahead of his own times, with ideas still living today and thus the founder of modern musical life in Sweden. We look upon him not only as the conductor of the Royal Orchestra but also as the first Swedish-born composer of international level, the man who introduced pu pu public concerts in Sweden, the real founder of the Royal Academy of Music, with its music school and library. A wonderful musician and music teacher who encouraged young people to play and a friend of Handel and many contemporary composers. He lived and worked in transi transition periods in Swedish history regarding politics, culture, and music. Since life and work are closely connected, let us follow him in the journey of his life 
to understand his music. He was born in uh, 1694 as the eldest son of the court musician Johann Roman Sr., who was a violinist with a beautiful voice. The gifted boy got his first education from his father. At the age of seven, he performed at court where he skilled played difficult pieces by several composers. This may have, may have happened when the court celebrated the most glorious victory at Narva, when in November 1701, Charles XII totally defeated the, the Russians. And then Sweden will show what it had. And then he got to play. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So he must have been gifted, as a very gifted, yeah. as, yes. a, as a young boy. Ye yes. And then he played the violin. The, the that violin, was his yes. instrument. Yeah, yeah. Yes. He, he played the violin and oboe, but this time he, at, at court it was okay. the violin. He played them skilled. <laughs> um, some years later, in uh, 1706, he was paid for taking part in a, a birth court birthday feast called Children's Comedy. Probably from this time, he belonged to the Royal Orchestra as an unpaid musician. And in 1711, at the age of 15, he was employed as a paid musician. In these early years, Roman must have met a person at court who was of central importance in his life, the princess and future queen Ulrika Eleonora, Jr. Please, Max. She had a nice voice and was a good harpsichord and clavichord player, and music was her consolation in life. They may have played together, the princess and the son of a court musician. As an adult, she was a Rom Roman's good fairy, who always helped and protected him as long as she lived. Can you come up with Bilder, Max? There is one, yeah. In the same year when he was employed, 1711, uh, the conductor of the Royal Orchestra, Anders von Duben, acted as a cree to the king, who at that time had his whereabouts outside Bender in the Ottoman Empire. Among other things, he had some commissions concerning the court orchestra. The most important of them was to convince that the king that the royal ensemble needed singers whom it totally lacked. And there were some minor economic things that the vice conductor of the royal orchestra should have some salary added to his salary and that the boy Roman be permitted to go abroad for some years to complete his education and thereby keep his salary. See, this was something of economy that the king must decide. And, and the king was abroad in the, in the wars, so yes, he yes. wrote to him from Sweden. To no, no, no. He, w he, he visited him in, in Bender. Ah, he visited him yeah. in Bender. Okay. Yeah, it was a journey of um, nine months okay. to go from Stockholm to, to Bender. However, the king had no thoughts of employing a castrato or a singer from the Hamburg Opera, but blessed the two other proposals by an open letter of the 19th of March, 1712. But Sweden was at war, while Roman's journey was delayed until the turn of the year 1716, when the king was back in Sweden, and there was a hope and longing for peace. So Roman left Stockholm with his traveling funds as a gift from the Princess Ulrika Eleonora. His goal was England and London, where he soon was employed by John Heidegger to play in the orchestra of Handel's Opera Company. The years in London were decisive, uh, of decisive importance. Here he played in two, Handel's, two of Handel's opera orchestras, took lessons in composants, composition composing with uh, Johann Christoph Pepusch and violin with most probably Fran Francesco Gemignani and uh, Attilio Ariosti for the, the Damore. In London he was known as the Swedish virtuoso. There he began to compose and there he had possibilities of studying music in private libraries. I'm uh, thinking of canons with the first Duke of Shandos. He, had, he owned all the Shandos anthems. He must be in there copying. Mm. 
he brought a big own co music collection when going back to Sweden. Big collection which he used. And that's why uh, a lot of, of foreign music uh, was played in, in, in Stockholm quite early after they had been written. Oh, I yeah. mean, he, he brought a lot of music for yeah. both his trips. Yeah, uh, yes, and on bo both his uh, trips, yes. yes. For the first one, he had mu much uh, English music, yes, much, very much uh, Handel and, and early uh, Italians uh, living in, in London at that time. Yes. When the long war, was come, war came to an end after the death of Charles XII in 1618, and Sweden had peace with its enemies, Roman had orders to return to Stockholm. Thus he left the good life he had in England and was back in September 1721. The contrast between the musically rich and economically safe life he had in London and the poor situation in the capital of Sweden must have been a shock to him. Around 10 years later, Roman explained the situation. I received the orchestra in such a state as a war, starvation and plague had left it. With no salary paid at all, the situation seemed so severe that he asked for his permission to quit. But the Queen and King did not want to let him go. He must have negotiated about the conditions to stay and was promised the place as vice conductor of the Royal Orchestra and a higher salary. That was in December 21. But since at the beginning of the next year still no salaries had been paid, he once more asked for permission to quit and leave Stockholm, most probably for Kassel, where he had a place as intendant of the court of orchestra uh, in the years 21 and 22. He was again promised a higher salary and most probably also the place as ordinary conductor of the Royal Orchestra, which was expected to be free in some years. Also, the musicians should have their salaries which had not been paid in two years. And how did they survive? They must have their salaries to, to, to play. Of course, of course. Uh, to exist. Hard times. Mm. Uh, they, they were ho hardest times in Swedish history. Okay. Mm. Uh, already at this time, he must have had a plan to reorganize to help the music in Sweden. An enormous work waited for him. The orchestra was modernized so that vice and youth instruments disappeared uh, the French one away, and the violin family was preferred. He convinced the king to decide that the lifeguard oboists should play in the royal orchestra when the conductor needed them, not only at the, at the court concerts, and here we have uh, here Roman, but also at the rehearsals, so that the orchestra should come to a deeper maturity. This is Roman. Of course, not only playing in the concert, but also rehearsal. Rehearsals, yeah. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's a good idea, I would say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, it was not obvious no, at that time. No, of course. Uh, since the oboists had their salaries, this arrangement of strengthening the orchestra did not burden its budget. He exchanged the two boy sopranos against two women, uh, or for the alto, tenor, and bass parts, he used good voices among the Stockholm church musicians, especially the cantores, of which sa some became unpaid members of the orchestra. He also used good, used good amateur musicians and music students at the Uppsala University, so that he built a growing group of unpaid musicians around the few paid musicians of the orchestra. So then he had a, a, a bigger uh, orchestra yeah. for some occasions. Yeah. 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 Uh, the budget allowed twelve musicians, including the twelve, the 12, 12. Mm -hmm. including the conductor, mm -hmm. and some unpaid. So say it's fifteen. What can you do with fifteen musicians? A lot, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> <but> <laughs> 
But Anders van Duven obviously did not believe Roman, believe in Roman as his successor and invited Konrad Friedrich Hudelbusch, a German composer, to come to Stockholm and he arrived here in the spring uh, 23. The two were rivals and fought with music in what we may be described as composition competitions. There are some uh, groups of areas to point at that. The Queen supported Roman and Hurlwurst left again at Easter time uh, 25 and then he's well, was with Matteson saying you're so boring in Sweden. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Roman thanked the Queen for her protection in the birthday cantata uh, he wrote uh, for her in 1726 uh, and he uh, did it in two ways, a long dedication where he describes her as a kenner of music and promoter of culture in general and by quoting his own music in four of the moments of the cantata. Three of them are taken from his flute sonatas composed in London uh, and one of them is reused in the Golovin music from uh, 28. And Roman used his many lo own loans deliberately to, to um, spread his mu music and make it known in broader parts of society. A method of repeating, or everybody would hum the, his melodies. Yes, of course. Yes, it's uh, repeating, repeating. Yeah. Thus, they are frequently used in the 1720s to his second journey abroad, uh, uh, 1735. That is the time when he was struggling for his ideas and musical taste. And could we please ha hear something from the Golovin? Yes, we have another movement from the same party music from 1728. 1728, yes, yeah. in Stockholm. <coughs> Så Ola, vad är det vi kommer att få höra nu? Nu ska vi höra ett andantino från en svit från Golovin. Musiken. One movement from this Golovin music by Roman. Written for a party in Stockholm. Uh, arranged by the Russian count Golovin. He was some kind of diplomat in Stockholm at that time. He was a Russian minister. minister yes. yes. And he organized, organized the party. And they needed a lot of music, of course, for this party. Yes, and this party was to celebrate the coronation of the Tsar Peter II. Okay. Um, oh, there was a, a big illumination with two words in, in Russia, Melanfolklig uh, Gladia, so the joy between nations. Oh, that's great. Yes. Okay.
Wonderful. So uh, that was 28. Yes. Yes. And then, but he, he went on with another journey as well. Yes, yeah. a, a, a bit later. A bit later, okay. Yeah. So now he was back in Sweden, was trying to reorganize yes. the orchestra and get yes. things better. Yes. Yeah. And when Hullebus left, the way to the place as, as, an, as an ordinary conductor of the Royal Orchestra seemed to be open. The vice conductor, Gottfried Buchholz, um, died in October 26 after several years of illness. Uh, and Anders von Duben was expected to leave the Royal Orchestra for his duties as Marshal of, of the court, the advanced. A special sum was reserved for the Royal Orchestra for buying and copying music, tuning the harpsichord, care of instruments, and other things. It, it was a new thing. They, they didn't have that before? No, no. no. Okay. So uh, they, 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 there were great uh, difficulties of getting, getting music. Of course. Oh. Uh, Roman prepared a printed edition of his flute sonatas, and Telemann was in, engaged to sell the music, and announced this in Hamburg newspapers in November and December 26. But von Duven was again of another opinion and had an in, in a letter to the king that he wanted to see his niece Carl Gustav von Duven as his uh, successor, with a reason that, that the post after around 90 years of service should remain in the family. Furthermore, the position consisted of two tasks both director and conductor of the Royal Orchestra. Being director was an official position and, or administration. Mm -hmm. And these were, uh, were reserved for the nobility. Drummer was a commoner. Yeah. The problem was solved when the two positions were given to different persons and the Chamberlain Karl Frank was appointed a new di director. Drummer was appointed the ordinary conductor of the Royal Orchestra on the Queen's birthday on the 23rd of January 1727. And Max, a portrait of her. This was no chance but a gift to the Queen. Here you have your Kapellmeister. Hmm? Roman thanked by dedicating the, the print of his flute sonatas on the 4th of July 1727 which was her name day. Still, today is still Ulrika. But troubles were not over. In August 27, a new marshal of the realm was appointed. Magnus Julius de Lagarde belonged to the old Swedish nobility, a family which was of French origin. From the late um, 17th century and almost uh, all the 18th century, Sweden was very French, language, fashion, customs, and music. And here Roman came with his Italian taste. De Lagarde became Roman's enemy, who in 1730 convinced the king to decide that the royal orchestra should be established in the French taste. His reasons for this were that the French ensemble was easier to keep at a high level to a lower cost than the Italian one, and that French music was what people were used to hear and knew. There must have been hard discussions on musical styles, which ended up in the decision that Roman was allowed to continue his work and thereby show the beauty of Italian music, which in fact reversed the royal decision. From the time around 1730, Roman began to perform big vocal church music, uh, and the time was deliberately chosen when he, in Easter time, 1731, gave the first public concert in Sweden. He there connected with a, a European tradition, but had also other intentions. When performing the Brockespersson public concerts, gave the orchestra constant exercise and served as rehearsals for important performances at court. Yeah, so that was a new thing. Yes. And uh, an audience that didn't belong to the court, they could go to a concert the court and, and, pay, pay and pay 
yes. for the ticket and then listen to music. Yes. And what you mentioned was the Brockes Passion yeah, by Handel. Yeah, it's the, by, uh, uh, in his, um, uh, uh, in, in his uh, version, yes. 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 Um, was it a success, these concerts? Uh, yes. People liked it very much. Yes. They, they yes. wanted to. Yes. But he, he, cou he couldn't uh, get this pressure on the orchestra at court. No, no. of course. So he w went outside yeah. to, the, to the, the audience and uh, they were... Get them to play more often and f e for an audience. Yes, and, and uh, they, they were all also... Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Developing, kind of, yeah, developing, yes, developing, yes, yes. yes. Uh, in the, at the end of the, con the uh, 18th century, we, we were we talking about Irving's concert, it's yeah. the same thing. Rehearsal yeah. concerts. Rehearsal yes. concerts, yes, yes. yes. And they were, the, co the concerts, they were a method of making his musical taste known in broader parts of the society. He sought for, for support mm -hmm. for his okay. method, for, for his ideas, and okay. for his music. It's, it sounds like he, he started to, div uh, to be a part of the, of, uh, really be a part of the musical landscape in, in Stockholm yeah. right now. Yes. People yes. started yes. to knew, uh, know about him and, yes. and his music w was played. Mm. Mm. But also Handel and other music. Yeah. Yeah. And the co co um, earlier the churches had been the concert uh, halls. Oh yeah. And the movies out to a uh, yeah. perform. But you could never pay for a, for no, a ticket no, and go to no, a concert. No, that no, was new no, from no, thirty-one. That was new, yes. and, and every everyone who could afford yeah. to to buy a ticket could go to the concert. Okay. And now we come to Doman's second journey. Uh, abroad, it had several reasons. The official reasons, reason was that he, trying to regain his hearing, should use the warm bath at Ischia outside Naples. But of course, it was also a journey in mu music to strengthen his musical network and bring together a useful music collection. Yeah. He was away for two years, from 35 to 37, at first, he revisited uh, England and met Handel again, and Max, please support it, of Handel. Thereafter, he went through France and reached Italy. In Naples, he met composers and studied music in libraries, composers as Leo, Saro, Pergolesi. He stayed in Rome, Padua, with Dantini, uh, Bologna with Perti and Laurenti, thereafter Vienna, München, Augsburg, Dresden, where he met Hasse, and Berlin. A pattern can be seen that he met orchestra, le orchestra leaders, composers, and violin virtuosos. Maybe the va Bologna violinist um, Laurenti inspired him to his Asadji for violin without a bass. Because Laurenti has always uh, uh, served uh, Tartini, okay. but, but much uh, later. But, but he met with Handel again, this, yes. this journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. But he didn't return to London, so he went to Italy and then back to Sweden. Yeah, yes, the other he way made around. that. Yeah. yeah, yes. And you said something uh, before that you think they, they were friends, yes. Handel and, and Roman. Yes. And uh, we know that he, he was very inspired by Handel and mm. he took a lot of music back. Yeah. with him to, mm -hmm. to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. Sh shall we have something uh, by Handel as well? Yeah, oh yes. I, yeah? yes, please. Do you, you have a it's something. It's a good idea. Not only Roman, mm -hmm. also Handel. That's well, great. Asked, why do you think you were friends? Is there any document about it? Uh, why Handel and Roman, Roman, have to, have to say, <laughs> Roman, yes. where, where they were friends? Uh, Is there any? Because, uh, because of South. <laughs> Aha, okay, th so uh, he told about the friendship. Yes. Nine years after his yes, death. Yes, yes. So, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, oh, it's with yeah, okay. Okay. Uh -huh. they, um, they knew how to value him. 
Henry Bonaccini, Geminiani. Uh, they... New to value Roma? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was a small, small world, of yeah. course. A very small world. Yes. We hope that they had some beers together in London. <laughs> That's great. So, Olaf, what are we going to hear now? I think we're going to hear uh, Chacon by Henry. Uh, Pasakalia. Uh, Pasakalia. Uh, Pasakalia by, by uh, great. Georg Friedrich Handel.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we will continue with uh, when he's coming back. But, yes. Um, I would like to invite you as well, Mr. Koopman, into the conversation, because uh, what we have been uh, talking about is a bit about the international world. Uh, the, then, back then, uh, of course, Roman came back as a quite educated mm. uh, musician and composer to, to Sweden. Um, and uh, the musical life today is, of course, very international. It was then and it is now. Uh, just a quick question, uh, Mr. Kuhlman, you, you travel around the world. Uh, I mean, back then, I would presume that when you came to different countries, it sounded very, very differently in different countries. Um, would you say it's, it's like that today, when you meet modern orchestras playing Baroque music and Mozart and so with them? Do they all so sound the same nowadays, or um, is it a difference? I mean, it's, uh, I, I would say for modern orchestras, uh, long ago, the sound of the orchestra and that you knew, ah, this is Berlin, this is um, uh, Vienna, this is Amsterdam, you heard because of the oboe, the first oboe. I think the oboe playing was very determined for uh, to know what instrument, what the orchestra it was. Um, when the Baroque orchestra started uh, in the 60s, maybe in the 50s, I should say, in Germany already, um, uh, then, of course, we were happy that anybody was able to play the instrument. Yeah. I remember the moment that um, uh, when I started Musica Antica Amsterdam, a very small group, um, that uh, uh, the Brock players were so happy with playing an open E string because that's oh, <coughs> And they did it so that now you would say, oh, could it be a little bit less, please? Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so in the beginning it was just to survive. Um, intonation was a problem. I mean, if you hear this now, I mean, beautifully played. And uh, in the beginning, it was much more difficult. So there were all kind of people all over the world who came to one or two places in Europe to study. Yeah. Uh, the Hague was uh, important at that point. Basel was important at that point. And there were not so many other conservatories where you could study instruments. Now mm -hmm. you can study historical instruments everywhere, which is good. And as well, it means that on this moment, there's one risk, a dangerous risk, is that if you put musicians playing Brock instruments from over the world and you say, okay, today we are going to do a Handel Concerto Grosso, it will work, because there's a kind of Brock Esperanto. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that uh, the, the good groups of the Brock orchestras or Brock ensembles, um, if the leader of the group, if that's at the harpsichord, if it's at the first violin, if it's at the cello, it doesn't matter where it is. Um, if he or she has an idea, then suddenly you think, hey, it can sound completely different. So I think it's so important that we try to find back uh, uh, identity in the Baroque music. And mm -hmm. of course it's happening. But that mm -hmm. was uh, when in the 70s Baroque music went up uh, very easy. Um, then students came and they wanted to know, they wanted to read treatises. Then there came a second generation of, of students who didn't want to read the treatises because they were happy when the teachers had done it already. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they knew everything. And I think now we start back in a situation mm -hmm. where the younger generation is, is, is eager to know. Mm -hmm and as well to do it different and i don't say it's always a question of doing it different it's just a question to try to find your truth mm -hmm. there's not one truth to play brock music with historical instruments mm -hmm. there are many ways uh, i would think if bach was playing music by rameau <laughs> or by roman uh, but maybe roman was for him a little bit closer mm -hmm. than rameau um, then uh, it would certainly be very interesting but if it was french music the french composer might not have known recognize this music. And the same thing, if Rameau uh, had played music by Bach, uh, it would certainly be very interesting because he's a great musician. But mm -hmm. did Bach recognize his music? So internationally, it was very separate, not only Italy, France, but as well uh, in, in France, François Couperin, Rameau, they would have a different way of playing the music. Right. Although for the people uh, writing treatises like Raquenet uh, saying, uh, about, you know, if you have to choose between French and Italian music, me as a Frenchman, I'm a bit uh, sad because our music, our musicians, they can play well trills, but they have no technique. Uh, if you hear the Italians, they 
they really can play and uh, and then they come up with a, with a question like uh, uh, Sunday afternoon uh, one o'clock at the uh, Rialto Bridge in, in Venice. There's somebody standing, waiting outside and seeing somebody pass with an instrument saying, hey, are you free this afternoon? I have a concert at three. A two o'clock rehearsal. And so he collected the whole orchestra and some singers and they did a concert. And of course people always stay, played one style. F uh, they say from Corelli, Corelli, when he had to play in French style, for him it was abacadabra. <laughs> and uh, the French king felt it was, if this was a great, co great violin player, you couldn't hear that. No. So uh, when the French were playing Italian music, and they did, but sometimes in secret and more and more openly, it was, of course, a different way of playing Italian music than the Italians yeah. did. And they say when the Italians were playing, like Corelli as well, when he was playing, you saw his eyes were rolling in his, uh, the holes and you saw him uh, mad because of the music. And the French playing very okay. neat, yeah. very precise. Of course, that's black and white. Yes, and I think black and, but black and white tells us something about uh, how people thought about music. And I think for us it's important to find where we are. We have to play, as well as Baroque orchestras, we have to play not only Lully or Roman or only Bach, but we have to play all kinds of styles. Yes. And it's good to try to, to be uh, somebody who knows about what the style is. Schutz said already a uh, long time ago in a preface, uh, dear colleagues, if you want to play music, and he would talk about Monteverdi, that kind of style, if you play that music, don't make a fool of yourself. Go to understand the music by yourself or go to a colleague who knows better than you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's important with Brock music. I think the renaissance of historical interpretation and historical informed um, uh, practice will work on if the younger generation will say as well, uh, Coleman, you did that right with that. I don't believe it. Where did you find the source? Or we would also... But I know in my generation, if I asked my teacher Leonard or Hanon Kuhr why, they were almost uh, really angry because you didn't ask your teacher no. why. They knew it. And I think that's a good thing of our time. Yes. That we can do. But I think uh, many of my students as well should ask more why. Yeah. And I think with this why, we get a new development in the early music. Um, I, I see the interpretation of Baroque music as a puzzle, and a six-hour puzzle. And how, do, how much do we know uh, by treatises? It's easy to get to 20%. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult to get to 35%, but if we go much further than that, what do we know about rubato? Uh, what do we know um, uh, if we find one source about too much vibrato, like Gimignani, and he said he was a horrible leader because he was so uh, incredibly unrhythmical, maybe playing too much rubato. Mm -hmm. would be an interesting source for Rubato, by the way. Um, so I think there are many things we still don't know, and uh, we should research on and accept. L let's say, when I was uh, starting with my Bach cantato recording, uh, Rifkin came up with his theory that a choir didn't exist. And an orchestra, if Bach had two first violins and two second violins, that was a lot. And uh, so I thought, okay. I never thought about that. Let's, let's go into sources. And I found out that many of the sources he was using, and particularly Andrew Parrott, what's in the name, uh, was, uh, uh, was giving half part of the source, and the other part he let away. Like, uh, he quotes uh, a source where they say, a choir should be four or eight uh, soloists, singers. Uh, and there is the quote stopped by Rifkin, but the goat goes on and says, then you can add some less good people to build up the capella. L like Roman uh, did with the orchestra. Yeah. 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 He had some paid musicians and then a bunch of music yeah, playing along at, at for fuller sound. At all the court chapels, it was like that. I mean, uh, if you could play violin, please come and join. Mm -hmm. And if you were playing too much other tune, they said, don't join us anymore. <laughs> 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 and, and That's funny. So I think people were quite direct, but... Um, one court had to fight against the other because they wanted to be number one. And if you were a small court, you could say, okay, we have no money. But the small courts tried to get the best musicians, then fewer, and they were giving lessons to the other ones. Mm -hmm. So I think it was an interesting time. And uh, I don't believe in, in uh, that uh, orchestras in, in Bach's time, in Roman's time, 
were having more than five, six first violins. Maybe they had only three. But lower than that, I don't believe it, because just try to play in tune, high up, mm. um, it's, it's difficult. And why to do it? Mm. Why to compose for a group when you know, ah, this is very dangerous. So if you have four violins, five violins work well. Seconds, maybe four, violas, two, mm -hmm. three, cellos, two, one contrabass. I think you are exactly the orchestra with Quan's things. It's a good orchestra to accompany and to make timid music. And if it was a bigger orchestra to play symphonies like Mozart, uh, maybe some of the symphonies of Roman as well could have a bigger orchestra, but it's not always difficult to play. But t tomorrow you will give a concert with the Royal Philharmonic yeah. Orchestra here. So how many musicians do you use for the Roman Symphonia tomorrow, for example? No, because I you can choose, yeah. I presume. I, I, I use for the whole program the same group, which is bigger than um, I do with Brock Instruments, because at Brock Instruments I do with five. Uh, but with, with modern orchestra I normally do six or eight. I, I work here with eight people, and people are really trying hard to come into the style. They are very open, they are willing, and of course with a modern instrument, with a modern bow, it's much more difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see that every day there are more Brock bows around. I don't know where they get them from. Ah, uh, that's interesting. There, there, uh, in the orchestra, a few people who play Brock instruments. Yes. There are a few people as well who play in other groups, Brock groups. And some people do it by heart, because it's like, do it, do it at home. I remember that when Yo-Yo Ma played the first time with Amsterdam Brock Orchestra, of course, he had to play with gut strings and a, and a broke bow. He said, my God, this is difficult. <laughs> yes. And he's not a bad player. N no, you can not uh, say that. And uh, he, he asked our cellist, uh, can I have a lesson? Can you help me half an hour, uh, maybe an hour, just to find out? And he saw how subtle things you can do with a broke bow, which is difficult to imitate. Um, I mean, a broke oboe is a different instrument than a modern oboe. And I know Marcel Polsele, a very good Brock oboe player. He's for years trying to discover to make an instrument, a modern oboe, which is in the bore, much closer to a Brock instrument. Mm. He thinks it is possible. So um, I think in, in my time when I started, then um, there was the group who played historical instruments and, the, and of course the modern symphony. The concert for Oxford would say, ah, those people, the spinnen, they, yeah. uh, they have nice ideas, but they cannot play. No. I always said, they can play, but they have no idea. And then Hanan Kuhl came to work with them, and first we broke musicians said, oh, you shouldn't do that. And now you see that most, the, the good orchestras in the world, ask broke specialists to come, because they don't want to make themselves a fool. Uh, no. If it's Boston, if it's Chicago, uh, all these orchestras. And it's nice to work with a group who can play and be a mentor. Try to say, yes. not you are not allowed to play Bach, but say, you are allowed to play Bach, but you should do it well. Yeah. And you tomorrow you will play a Sinfonia by Ruman yeah. with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah. Uh, shall we listen to one of the movements from that Sinfonia? Yeah. And we can just imagine, because these uh, musicians, they play on uh, period instruments, historical yeah. instruments, yeah. which are closer to what Roman had yeah. and heard. And tomorrow you can listen to the concert uh, from here, the concert hall, and you can hear it in another version, version with modern instruments. So please.
Thank you. We talked about uh, being in an international musical world, and Roman did get back to Sweden and continued with his work. And um, when talking about the international scene, uh, in that, those days they sang in Italian, of course, mm -hmm. and in, in French and in, in German and so, but to sing in Swedish, mm -hmm. that uh, quite a lot of people, they uh, thought that was impossible. Or, yes. or almost yes. impossible. It was only the folk music that you sang. Well, sang they, they, th they thought that the Swedish language was too hard for music. It was too hard for ah, music. Yes. Yeah. It's too hard. You said like something Dutch. like, like Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. You had the same uh, the same uh, debate in in uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah. In, in those days. Yeah, uh, they were singing at home and in the church in Dutch. Yes. But uh, opera was done in in French or Italian, mm -hmm. and sometimes recitatives were translated in Dutch because you needed to know what it was all about. And, uh, yeah, you didn't have the text ma machine. Or no, no, you didn't have the machine. <laughs> no, <laughs> in those days. So to know where it was all about, that was important. But, yeah. uh, but no, nobody would think about composing seriously in Dutch. No. But, but Roman, he had, a uh, he had a thought about yes. Swedish as a language that you could actually sing. In. Yes, yes. So he worked a lot with that. And he also translated. He, uh, yes, he uh, translated uh, everything. He, he, uh, if he arranged music by other composers, uh, he translated it. Yeah. So and we know about Aces and Galatea by Handel, yeah, yes. translated by Roman and yes. performed in Stockholm. And the Brockes. And the Brockes Passion yeah, as well. Yes. But he also composed uh, uh, to, to, uh, Swedish text. I yes. Mean, uh, at the end of the uh, 1720s, there was a group uh, at, at court uh, where the languages and using the problem, uh, the word uh, and tone, uh, must have been discussed. And there are uh, um, songs with in uh, German and French and Swedish text. Uh -huh. So they could compare, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yes. They, okay. This is experimental workshop. Okay. Sh shall we uh, do an uh, experiment here as well? <laughs> Let's hear a song by Ruman, yeah. an original compo composition by him. Yes. To uh, a text from the Bible. Uh, yes. From, uh, and then it's in Swedish, this song. And the translation is from the Charles the Twelfth. Yes, Bible. His, his Bible was 1704. 1704. Uh, I will read the text in Swedish. Jag vet att min förlossare lever. Och han ska på sistone uppväcka mig av jordene. Och jag ska sedan med dessa mine hud omklädd vara. Och skall i mitt kött få se Gud. Honom ska jag mig se. Och mina ögon skulle skåda honom och ingen annan.
Tack så mycket Jenny och Mime och Marcus. Så so, uh, yeah. yeah, uh, I remember we did uh, the uh, recording at some concerts with all the books with Katadas and uh, Motets, how you call it, called it, and you called it Anders Duben. He was the one who gave it to Uppsala, to yes. the library. And, uh, but it's interesting, in Books Hooters work, there are a few pieces as well in Swedish and Danish. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, for poor Dutch people, what to do with the language? So I asked, uh, I, I knew a, a former student of mine, uh, and I asked her, please, can you say what to do? And it was difficult for us to come close by. You have to judge if it's a little was bit. Was she Swedish? Yeah, in Swedish and in, in, in another piece. But your student. Uh, uh, she's, to... she's living in Stockholm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And so, via telephone, <laughs> okay. <laughs> she was teaching us because it was, uh, yeah, it was just completely different uh, vocals. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so it was interesting. I said, while you were singing, I was suddenly thinking about, oh, we did it as well. And, uh, yeah, Swedish and yeah. Danish. Oh, yeah. that's, that's great. Um, so, but language is, of course, very important for, for yeah. the music to, yeah. to make it. But, I mean, it, it uh, works in Swedish, works don't in you think? <laughs> and, and later on, I mean, Roman's work with the Swedish language and, and uh, uh, composing in Swedish and, and translating, it also um, was very important for the later operas that we actually have in Swedish. Yes. In Swedish. Uh, do you uh, the, yeah, of course, uh, his uh, mm -hmm. the work with he, which is the uh, ob most obvious show, showing uh, the, what he called the böjelighet. Uh, uh, smoothness. Yes, to, to, uh, of the Swedish uh, music for, to language. Uh, to music, uh, he he sh chose um, Leonardo Leo's Dixit Dominus Domino Meo. He deliberately cho uh, chose the, uh, a work with a foreign language to to, to, to show adapt Swedish adapt music Swedish to the uh, Swedish text to, yeah, to the, okay. and, uh, with an excellent result. Yeah, yes, I, I mean it's it's a work that has to be done. Yeah, to yes. But he had always difficulties Forward. there. He was uh, always... Uh, uh, people told him, uh, no, no Swedish text, no Swedish text. No, and when, when he's talking uh, about uh, the Swedish music, he al always means a vocal music with a Swedish text. Okay. And so the singers were Swedish as well, in that case. That yes. Because yes. to have an Italian castrato <laughs> to sing in Swedish will be... No, maybe <laughs> it would have been quite, quite uh, tricky. Uh, so we're, um, we're uh, slowly coming to an end here today. But, um, I mean, what, what uh, if you, Ton Kupman, if you would say something... Have you done a lot of romance work before? Or uh, yeah, not a lot, but I did quite something and I looked... In, because I was thinking about uh, the bigger works he did, like dotting on uh, music, like the, the Golovin, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, music, very beautiful music. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so when I came into contact with music by uh, Roman, by the dotting on Brochokst, uh, by uh, Lars Brolin, I think yes. he was the leader at that yes. point. And uh, he fell in love with this music, and he was really making CDs and LPs at that point it was. And every time when I saw him, he brought one. He said, yeah, you should listen to this. This is a great composer, but nobody knows it yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's interesting to see now that, uh, particularly in Sweden, there's a lot done now for the music of, uh, of women. But uh, in Holland, we call him the Swedish Telemann, and you always <laughs> say the, the Swedish Handel. Yeah. But I, I would put him a little bit more closer to Telemann then. Yes. But as well with the, all his, uh, the, yes. what he did for type of music, for all kinds yes. of, of yes. combination and things. So I think he's a composer with needs, like Books to Wooden, and still many of the, what we call now the minor composers, to be uh, acknowledged as a great composer. Yes. 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 And, and he's, I think he's our big Baroque composer, of course. Yeah. We should and, play his and music. Uh, um, we, as, as musicians, we should make publicity for him because he deserves it really to be known 
not only in Sweden, but outside mm. as well. No. Mm. And I mean the work that you do now, Eva, with mm. his life, and mm. uh, which we have not known so much about, no, but exactly. now we start to know through your uh, research and so. so. It's also important, of course, for... for yes, it's important to understand him. To understand him because and the time. He, yes, and, and the time, yes. yes. Um, because he was a he was a servant yes. at court, and uh, now we will have the feast uh, that and that, and please fix the music. Yes, and uh, he did. And he did. Yes. Uh, and many times he was in a hurry, but he did it. Yes. <laughs> but I think if you if you perform music by Tillman or by Handel or yeah. by Bach, even if you do it very bad, it still remains good music. Yes. Yes. If you do Couperin and you do it badly, it doesn't remain well. And I think it's the same with yeah. uh, with Roman. You should give real attention, mm -hmm. not to say, okay, we'll play it and we're, we're a good musician, we'll, we'll do something. Just prepare it well, think for variety. And uh, and then I think, if I see his bigger works, how much variety is there with the instrumentation? I think, lovely to listen. I'm mm -hmm. certain there is an audience mm -hmm. for this music. Yes, yes. of yes. course. Uh, we have these excellent musicians here. Do you have, uh, when you listen to the conversation and so about Roman and when you play the music, uh, is there, uh, do you have some questions that you would like to ask to these people with a lot of knowledge? Is it fun to play Roman? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But I always recognize there is still, I used to say, some charming Swedish accent into it. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's mm -hmm. like, it's, yes, it's French, mm -hmm. but there is something always a little turn or mm -hmm. accent or, mm -hmm. yaha, <laughs> something Swedish comes out. And also a little folk music fiddling, yeah. mm -hmm. because I come from Slovakia and I can grew mm -hmm. up with the folk music. There are little corners I can't help, just mm -hmm. kind of throw the ball a yeah, little more into, yeah. over the board but uh, yes, little, would, would you call it little accent a yes. Swedish uh, charming mm -hmm. accent in the oh, that's interesting could um, is that something we can hear in the hornpipe that you will play now no yeah you say so so um, <laughs> unfortunately we have to stop time flies um, and there's a lot to talk about um, and uh, thank you so much Tom Kopman and Eva Helenius and you musicians and uh, Jenny for this uh, hour together. And now we will end this with a hornpipe, also from the Golovin uh, music, this party music from 1728. Please. <laughs>